The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Elisa Baum, and I am Percona's Director of Product Marketing. We will begin in just one moment, but first, I'd like to conduct a bit of house cleaning. First, please raise your hand using the hand icon located in the GoToWebinar control panel to let me know that you can hear me. All righty. Okay, it looks like people can hear me, which is great. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. Next, during this webinar, you will be on mute. Should you have any questions during the discussion, please enter them in the questions field within the control panel. At the end of the webinar, we will take time to answer as many questions as possible, and those that aren't addressed will be answered in a follow-up blog post entry on Percona's MySQL performance blog, and the speakers will probably reach out to you individually if it's a more in-depth um, kind of question. In addition, a recording of this webinar will be made available to everyone within 48 hours. So with that said, I'd like to thank you for attending today's webinar, Multi Data Center MySQL with Continuant Tungsten. It will be presented today by Percona consultant Peter Burrows, and we also have a special guest star today, Robert Hodges, who is Continuant CEO and will be starting the show today. So with that said, I'll turn the floor over to Robert. Go ahead, Robert. Thank you very much, Elisa. Elisa, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Wonderful. Well, it's my pleasure to be here today and especially um, a pleasure to have the opportunity to work with Peter Boros from, uh, uh, from Percona. So as Elisa says, we'll be talking about multi-data center MySQL with Continuant Tungsten. So I'd like to dive right in and uh, just uh, tell you a little bit about what uh, we're going to be talking about today. So first of all, we'd like to start by discussing why multi-data center MySQL is so important and just give you an example of some of the complexities that are involved in achieving it successfully. We'll then go to talk about continuant tungsten and how it fills the gaps that exist in building these types of systems. We'll then switch over to Peter, to, who's going to do a demonstration of a couple different types of multi-data center topologies, and then conclude with a few practical steps to multi-data center MySQL. I should say in passing that uh, uh, if you're not familiar with Continuant, uh, we are a vendor of uh, uh, clustering and replication for uh, particularly for MySQL databases, but we also cover many other different database types as well. Uh, we're particularly focused on this type of problem of uh, enabling people to build large systems uh, using uh, replication and off-the-shelf MySQL. And our main product is Continuant Tungsten, which we'll be talking about. So with that, let's dive in and start with this question about why is it that we want multi-data center MySQL. So there's a number of reasons why you might want to spread data in MySQL across multiple locations. I've listed the three main ones, so I'd like to just go through them briefly. The first and most obvious reason to spread data out is for high availability. So if you have a problem in one location, what you want to do is have data copies as up-to-date as possible in other locations that are away from the problem and so you can keep running. There's another reason to move data in, in today's systems and that is that many of us are building systems that have users who are spread around the globe. So in order to give those users adequate performance, we want to move the applications and the data as close to MySQL uh, or as close to the user location as possible. So for example, if you have customers in the United States, you'd prefer to have data centers located within a relatively um, short distance uh, in terms of the latency. So using data centers, for example, in Amazon East or Amazon West. On the other hand, if you have users in Europe, you'd probably like to have them operating off a data center in the European region. And then there's a final topic about multi-data center MySQL, which, this, which is that as your, uh, as your business grows and as you have users spread out over different locations, it turns out that many of those users have different legal requirements for uh, keeping their data in some locations but not others. So for example, it's very common to have data that may not leave the host country uh, that it's generated in. 
Um, this is quite common with privacy regulations. So it's yet another reason for wanting to have MySQL in different locations, um, but perhaps with the data partitioned uh, within those locations. We'll talk less about that issue in this talk and focus mostly on high availability and performance. And as we drill down into the HA uh, topic, I'd like to give you just a quick example that shows that even though conceptually it's very simple to say have copies of data in multiple locations, when you actually drill down a little bit and consider what you have to do to achieve that, it's somewhat more complicated than it looks at first glance. So let's take a simple example of building systems in Amazon, which is something that I assume many of the people in in this call have familiarity with. Now, Amazon has a model where their data centers are divided into regions, and within those regions, they have what are called availability zones. So an availability zone is actually a separate site. It's an actual full-scale data center that's within a short distance, say, 10 or 20 kilometers of the other data centers in that region. So let's consider what happens if we have a, a, a failure. So one common type of failure in Amazon that has happened a number of times over the years is to have a problem with elastic block store. This is your net, uh, network attached storage. When you have an EBS problem, it means that the applications that work on that site may be either down or at the very least severely compromised. So in that case, applications running in a single AZ will be down. Now, Amazon, of course, recommends that, that you actually spread your applications across multiple AZs in a single region, and that's a, that's a best practice that's followed by many people. But in fact, it's not quite as simple as that because just going to spreading across the AZs doesn't fully protect you from EBS failures. There have been a number of cases already over the past two to three years where the EBS failure actually led to poisoning of um, uh, other Amazon infrastructure services running in other uh, AZs within the same region. So at that point, if you have the misfortune to hit one of those failures, your applications are now could be now down across the region. So in that case, it's important to have the applications running in the next region. But the way you do that and, and the way that you, you set these up is very important because if the applications are in any way coupled back to the, re to the applications that are running in the first failed region, you could now have degraded performance uh, in those regions as well. So it's very important then as you're thinking about this to not only think about dist uh, the distribution of your data and the management of that data in different locations, but we also want to think very hard about exactly how we do that distribution to eliminate problems like over-tight coupling between regions. So this leads to some requirements if you're going to build systems that depend on multi-data center MySQL. So one really important uh, requirement is to be able to handle local high availability within geographic regions. Um, for performance reasons, and, and you'll see an example of this in the demo in a little bit, it's very important for, the, um, for your data to be as close to your applications as possible. That means that if you have a failure of a single MySQL database or you have to take it offline for, for maintenance, you'd like to be able to replace it with a copy that's running within that region at the very least and even better within the same availability zone. So, that is, so you need the ability to have high availability then that covers you for failover as well as planned maintenance and upgrade. Beyond that, you need the ability to do advanced replication then to link up the regions. And this includes the ability to support flexible topologies. There's multiple ways that regions can be linked. The replication mechanism needs to be very tolerant of faults as well as WAN latency. So one of the things, of course, that, um, that you see as you move across WANs is that there's tremendous variation, even in Amazon, which has very good networking, there's tremendous variation in the network performance. You can go from, say, 100 milliseconds ping time between two sites. Um, that actually can go considerably higher uh, if Amazon is having issues, which is kind of rare, 
but more likely because somebody else on shared infrastructure is doing something that's consuming uh, bandwidth. So, and then finally, you need to have the ability to do transaction filtering so that you can actually control the types of things that move between sites. There's a final constraint on this when you're building this, and that is that as you, as you start to set up these multi-DC systems, it's very common to actually be doing this with a system that's already operating successfully within a single um, uh, Amazon availability zone or at most uh, a single region. So what you want to be able to do is introduce these changes with minimal changes to your applications and without needing to migrate your data to a new data uh, database type. So this is sort of an overview of, of why you want to, to go to multi-DC, a little bit of insight into some of the complexities that we see when, these, when we set these uh, systems up, and then what are some of the requirements to be able to deploy successfully and solve this problem. So with this, I'd like to jump in and just explain a little bit about how continuant tungsten fills these gaps that we see in terms of um, ability to, uh, to handle these problems. So the tungsten product is, fits in with MySQL in a very simple way. So we view MySQL as a building block as you are, uh, uh, you know, as you're building MySQL based systems. Um, uh, it's a very, very reliable server excellent for OLTP, has very good scaling, uh, is very well known. So the idea is that um, you're going to build systems using MySQL, you're doing that already, but Tungsten really comes in and picks up and handles the capabilities where MySQL leaves off. And these include the following, so obvious things like handling a failure of a single database, being able to do automated failover, being able to do transparent maintenance while your apps are running, so you've got 24 by 7 apps, being able to take a database out of service completely transparently without reconfiguring or restarting applications. Uh, being able to load, SQL, uh, load balance SQL transactions across databases. So you've got extra copies, you want to scale off them. Create disaster recovery sites. So this is beginning to edge into the multi-region capabilities. Um, have the ability to have data um, dynamically um, uh, or, or replicated in real-time remote sites, and then beyond that, to go to full multi-master replication where you have sites operating as peers. And then finally, um, and this is a capability we won't discuss any further in this, um, in this webinar, be able to replicate the transactions in real-time other database types. And this is becoming increasingly important because not only are systems geographically separated, but nowadays most large businesses use more than just MySQL, so you may have geographically distributed instances of MySQL that all feed into a data warehouse in a single location. So these are the capabilities that Tungsten supplies. What I'd like to do is now zero in on the capabilities that are particularly relevant for the problem that we're discussing this webinar today. So the slide that we're showing right now gives you the basic tungsten cluster architecture. And as I mentioned, the core of this is off-the-shelf MySQL. So you can use any MySQL version starting with 5.0 that pleases you. Um, so for example, if you're using Percona, it could be Percona 5.5, Percona 5.6, whatever, uh, whichever build you, you prefer. You start with that. And then um, tungsten adds the following to those, uh, to those uh, databases that you have running. First of all, we add async replication. So when we started out on this uh, some years ago, we built enterprise quality replication that includes global transaction IDs, special features designed to enable failover, uh, transaction filtering, um, parallel replication, things like that. That's then added to each of the hosts. Next to that, we have managers that allow us to do peer-to-peer -peer management. So the managers form a group, and this is what gives you your cluster. You go in there and, and talk to those to do your management. And then finally, and this is sort of the secret sauce in these, in these clusters, we have something called a tungsten connector, which is a layer in between. It's a proxy, understands the MySQL network protocol, and your applications connect to that, and it makes this cluster of off-the-shelf databases look like a single application uh, to your users, or a single um, a database uh, to your user applications.
So that's the basic architecture. Um, let me zero in just a little bit on the connectivity because as I mentioned, this is a, a pretty specialized feature that, that gives a lot of the power to this. So the tungsten connector, as I mentioned, is a, is a prop. It's very fast. It uses Java, uh, spawns a thread for each um, connection coming in, so it works very well on SMP hardware. Uh, it can run anywhere on the network. A uh, common way to do it is to put it on the same host as your app servers, but you can also put it behind elastic load balancer, uh, between H HA proxy, hardware load balancers. Uh, by default, when transactions come in and people uh, and or applications make connections, we route them to the master wherever it is. But we do have uh, options to enable read-write splitting. And one of the features of this is that this uh, is that when you when we do recognize a read, it is then load balanced across all available slaves. If no slaves are available, it goes on to the master. So this is a pretty powerful feature. Um, to enable you to get full utilization out of your hosts. And it also is key to enabling HA because having an indirection layer allows us then to do transparent reconfiguration of the system without the applications knowing. So let me give you an example of that. Let's talk about graceful failover. So this is an operation that you want to do if you need to do maintenance. Um, you want to take, for example, let's just take a, a typical example in, in Amazon is that you might want to take a server offline so that you can reprovision it on a larger instance size in Amazon to get better performance. So this is triggered by a command called switch. And basically what it does is um, the, the connectors halt the current transaction, wait till the current transaction ends, halt all further activity, and then allow the managers to reconfigure replication to promote a new master, in this case uh, host DB2. Um, and then they let the connections continue. This is designed in such a way that it's always zero data loss. Um, so they, we, we ensure that the transactions have stopped. Uh, um, we then uh, send a transaction through to ensure that the slave that we're promoting is fully up to date. Um, and then we have other specialized features of uh, killing things to permit late committing transactions from coming in, um, things like that. It's completely transparent to applications so that you can do this without having to reconfigure applications, do restarts, um, have broken connections. And the, all, and the reconfiguration, which is under the covers, of course, fairly complex, is completely transparent. You just issue a single command. So this is a very powerful feature and one that's commonly used to do your um, maintenance within a single region or um, a single availability zone. Uh, one thing I should point out is that these, these nodes can, of course, be spread across multiple availability zones. Um, if you're operating using on-premises data centers, they can, of course, span data centers that are short distance apart. Heart failover, on the other hand, uh, requires that we do an automated failover. So this is triggered by automatic rules that run in the managers. So when we detect that a master has failed, which we do by just um, seeing that it's non-responsive, we go ahead, find the most advanced slave, and uh, promote it. It's very fast for a process crash because that's unambiguous. Uh, we know the process is gone, so we immediately pick a slave to promote. That uh, promotion uh, typically occurs within seconds, even for very large instances. And then if you have a host crash where something drops up to the, off the network, that can be up to a minute. Um, you do require admin for recovery. We don't automatically recover them. We do expect that somebody will go look at the system and decide that it needs to be recovered. That can be done with a single command. So there is another case that we cover, which is a hard failure where, where you not only have um, a single node fail, but you actually have multiple node fails. Uh, fail, nodes fail. And in this case, it actually leads to a quorum loss. So like a lot of uh, high availability software, Tungsten does implement quorum between managers. Um, the managers maintain the cluster. We expect to have a majority in order to con continue. So when you get a case where, for example, you get uh, failures with multiple managers so that the one surviving manager, and for example here a node, um, can only see itself and doesn't have a majority, the entire cl uh, cluster stops. And once again, this feature works across Amazon availability zones, but we do not maintain quorum, or we do not recommend trying to do this across regions. Uh, you tend to lose quorum because of uh, variation in uh, WAN network connectivity. 
So that covers the basic uh, high availability features within a single region, and that's that's one of the sort of the legs on which you're going to build these systems or support these systems. What I'd now like to do is talk a little bit more about the uh, the multi-site features. And for this, I'm going to go ahead and uh, give you a little bit of an explanation of how replication works because uh, the point-to-point -point replication becomes very important here. So as you may be familiar, one of the um, key things that Continuum offers is Tungsten Replicator. It's out on code.google.com. Uh, it moves transactions between point A and point B, typically MySQL uh, databases, but it also can extract from Oracle. Um, and it, you can basically set up any uh, topology that you want. It knows how to replicate between clusters. The replicators have a kind of interesting property that they can run multiple replication services within a, a single process. Uh, we have global transaction IDs and transaction filterings and all kinds of things that you expect in a in an enterprise replicator like Golden Gate. Here's just a simple example that illustrates some of the flexibility. We have two clusters, one in Amazon East, one named East, one named West. The, uh, we want to uh, pull transactions from, this, uh, from these clusters and uh, fan them into a single database, which perhaps is used for reporting. So we have an East service on that replicator pulling from the East slave. We have a West service pulling from the West master. Of course, it could be configured differently and pulled from different um, replicators. And there's a number of, of useful features like this, but I think this illustrates sort of the basic flexibility that you have to work with. So here's how we'll use this for multi-site um, computing. So here's an example of full multi-master. And what we do here is set up the East and West um, uh, uh, clusters. Um, with their own application stacks talking directly to them. And we set up extra replication services that basically just link between the, um, the east and west locations. So these operate outside of the clusters and are completely independent of them. So if, and just for example, if you commit a transaction in west, it goes into the west master, it's replicated within the cluster to the slave. Meanwhile, the west uh, service over on the east site picks that up, and then it's supplied to both of the replicas there. So this is normal operation. Let's just take a couple examples of failures. Let's suppose that one of the, uh, one of the, failure, uh, one of the replicators is down for maintenance or failed on the east side. That's fine. The replication continues until that replicator gets back, in which case it, um, it it, it then continues replicating to the instance that it's pointed at. There's no reconfiguration of the system necessary to handle this failure. Similarly, if we have a local failure on west, the master fails, and we then promote our slave, um, either, and it's, uh, again, no, um, there's no reconfiguration necessary in the cross-site replication. It handles it automatically. And in fact, um, you can go to all the way to a full site failure. So let's say that the west region goes down completely. In that case, what happens is replication just stops between the sites. So the west replicators that are um, over on the east site and are trying to pull things from the west region just go into synchronizing mode and begin to uh, simply pull uh, uh, and go ahead and and they'll just uh, basically uh, remain in that mode until the west site comes back. Similarly, the east replicators will either stop. If they're in within the region, they may fail and just have to be restarted, but there's no reconfiguration necessary. Once you get west back up and running again, you just restart everything and your system um, uh, begins to run again. So let me talk to you. Uh, a little bit about another uh, topology that you can use for multi-site or multi-data center uh, MySQL. And as we'll discuss uh, shortly, MySQL doesn't work for every single application. In some cases, applications, or excuse me, um, multi-master does not work for every single application. In some cases, you still have to use basic uh, master-slave. And this is actually built into the clustering through what we call composite data services. And in this case, the clusters on each site themselves have a master-slave replication or, uh, a relationship to each other, and the connectors move the um, uh, move the data 
from one site uh, to the other. Um, so there's a very interesting feature here, which is that in this particular configuration, west is the is the primary, and we call that master that it has the primary master. Um, the east is the slave, so it has instead of a master, it has what we call a relay, and the connectivity in the in the tungsten connector knows where the primary master is. So if it sees a connection coming in to right, it will automatically forward it out to the west. So this is means that you don't have to worry about reconfiguring applications. Plus, you also have the ability to continue to do reads on whichever site is closest to you. Let's just show an example of a failover slave node. Again, no configuration necessary. It's handled within the cluster. Um, the West master fails. We promote the slave. We automatically ensure that the replication link continues to the um, uh, uh, to the East relay. Moreover, the um, the the, the application connectivity is then seamlessly redirected to the new master on the west site. Similarly, if we have a full site failure where the west site goes completely dark, um, you can then go ahead and using a simple command do a manual failover to the slave site um, and then basically all your applications will uh, point over there. This does have some consequences for application performance. We'll discuss those shortly, but at this point, I think that we're ready to go ahead and do a demonstration of these capabilities. Um, so uh, very quickly, um, Peter, are, are you ready to go? Yes, I am. Hi, Wonderful. can you hear me? Yes, and I've got just a slide shown, which um, do you want to just uh, describe the two topologies up front? I've got a couple of pictures of them, if you'd like, um, or we can just switch oh, okay. straight over to your um, to your demo. Okay, so first we will examine the the topology on the left hand side and we will make uh, we will make nasty failures in US East 1 which will ultimately bring down the complete data center and after that we will reconfigure the whole cluster to the second case where we will have an application in the in the EU uh, using this cluster and we will simulate a switchover from EU to US West Coast and you will see how well it works, let's say. Okay, so okay. Let's, let's, uh, let me go ahead and uh, make you presenter, Peter, and let's get going. Just find you in the list here. Here we go. I'll let you know when I see your slides. Okay. You should see my screen. I do. Off you go. Okay, so we have a bunch of uh, machines here. Twelve, four in each region. Three forms a cluster, so TW stands for Tungsten Webinar, and US uh, stands for United States, and E is for East, so USE 1 to 3 are the cluster nodes, EU 1 to 3 are cluster nodes, USW 1 to 3 are cluster nodes. And we have three benchmarking nodes in each region and they will run the application which in this case is Sysbench. So let's examine uh, the current situation a bit. So like with any other uh, continent tungsten cluster, Within a region, we can use the CCTRL utility to, to check the cluster state. What is probably uh, more interesting, and by interesting I mean uh, it wasn't in previous webinars, is the output of multi-trap CTL. And if you remember when Robert talked about uh, there is a replicator for each possible connection and it doesn't matter uh, doesn't matter if a single one of them fail. You have this script to have a nice uh, digested output uh, of, of what is happening in terms of replication. Uh, this utility actually has the, the same output on all the nodes, so you can examine the you can you can examine the you can examine the state 
regardless what node uh, you are running this on. And let's check the benchmarks. I wrote uh, some small scripts. First is sb.sh which just performs sysbench. In this case from the East Coast benchmarking node to the East Coast cluster. And let's start at that right away. Just to have some idea about how can that cluster perform. And we can see that it's around 20, 30, 50 transactions a second. And I have a script called sblimited.sh which is different in a way that we are running this with a limited transaction rate. And this means that in each second we will generate 10 new transactions. So this doesn't mean that we will do 10 transactions every second. It means that we will generate 10 new. And if I start this, uh, it will start uh, doing those transactions. And if I start this in every region, then in every region, this transaction will, this transaction will start, and they are replicated to every other region. For in order to to do this, we have three schemas. SB test USC, SB test USW, and SB test EU. So each region is replicated to each region. So you will see uh, you see how how it works. And right now, what I want to examine is that in the East Coast, I want to do a failover. Right now, my, my master is. Uh, the first node in the East Coast. Let's switch to the second one with the switch command USC2. And it starts to do the switching, but I'm more curious about the benchmarking node. So you can see that, that around 68 seconds transactions were stopped and we are still seeing zero transactions. And take a, a look at the queue length. The queue length is growing. So we are generating 10 transactions every second. And once the failover completed, so here we see zero transactions, then 10 transactions, but with a queue of 102. Then sysbench works on the queue, and uh, it works it down to queue length zero. And the failover started around 68 seconds, so a graceful failover took like 13-ish seconds, so not that much. And everything goes on uh, like previously. Uh, a bit more nastier case than this, if also let's see if uh, East 2 is the master now, and really East 2 is the master. Let's do a more harder crash. If you want to crash test something, you should always do it like this, because this is practically manual kernel panic on, on Linux. And actually, I pressed enter, but you didn't see it because, because of the kernel, kernel panic. And if I check the benchmarking node again, transaction stopped at 156 seconds, and we are started to generate a queue. In this case, it will take a little bit longer, and that kind of makes sense because we don't know. Oh, okay, it, took, it looks like it took a little bit too long. Uh, I have to, in, in this case, you and the failover happened, and it works down the queue. So Sysbench didn't have a, a big enough time mode. The failover was around 30, 40 seconds, so it's uh, under a minute. It didn't have a big enough time out. And when you are building highly available applications like this, the point of this demo, what uh, you know, you should take home, is that uh, you should expect that for some transient amount of time, maybe there will be no data available. And in that case, you have to do queuing somewhere. And in this case, queuing was possible because tungsten connector is a well-behaving application. 
and sysbench is a semi well behaving application because it uh, because it queued but you know the time out wasn't uh, wasn't enough and if we see it the, if we check the state now the first node is the master again and the second node in the east coast is shunned which means that the administrator has to recover it and let's uh, let's be even let's destroy even more stuff if I destroy this then I expect the benchmark to stop completely and if I check here I will see stop not, not available and this is not promoted to master and actually sooner or later it, uh, it should be shunned and I'm looking at the wrong sysbench see here you can see it queuing <laughs> and there you go so the third East Coast node, node uh, shut itself down because it lost quorum, and that's the and that's the behavior uh, we expect here. So let me let me stop the benchmarks, and let's use the remainder of the two sites to examine what happens if you want to do if you don't want to do multi master because in case of multi master you saw that we guaranteed some way that there will be no conflicts between data centers and we guaranteed that in a way that we use different schemas in different data centers it doesn't matter you know how you guarantee it it can be based on what records you write or what users you route to where with asynchronous replication and multi-master conflicts uh, doesn't play that too much there are uh, excellent webinars of uh, Giuseppe describing uh, that topic. So let's reconfigure the cluster and what I want to want to show you is that you can configure the whole thing through a single INI file which is very similar to my.cnf. So I define the data sources and I define all the possible connections for the replicators for a multi-site topology. On the benchmarking node, it's practically the same, except that in here in the East Coast, I have an additional connector for the benchmarking node. And if I fire TPM install here, it will only install the connector because it will know the cluster topology and it will know that this host is only a connector. So this uh, new INI file approach is very automation friendly. So, and I prepared the new INI file, which is tungstandardini.composite, which has a composite data source. So we will have EU as the master, and we will have West, uh, West as the as the failover site. So I will go ahead and uh, reconfigure tungsten like this. And you know I'm putting uh, the new configuration file in place and let's say now I'm playing uh, manual puppet daemon or manual chef client and I also want to do this on on the benchmarking node good and now that the new configuration is in place all I have to do is run from the staging directory 
ppm install, which will install the, the new configuration. And I can run it on every node, even in parallel. It doesn't matter. So every node is independent. So you, um, if you are, if you want to write a chef recipe or a, or a puppet manifest for this, you don't have to care about uh, which order you you do this or or anything. Once all the nodes uh, are done, the cluster will be up completely. So the connector is installed. The connector is complaining that I don't have extra backup installed. It's kind of bad because extra backup is awesome, but uh, but we don't really need that on the application server. So it's okay. And let's examine the multi-site uh, configuration. So if I take a look at the EU data source, the master is online and it has slaves. But if I change to to the West data source, which is US West Coast, yeah, this talks to the West Coast connector, so it would be smarter to do this from a West Coast node. But I want to show that it uh, that it works uh, from here as well, and it has a relay online, which means that uh, we can switch over to this. And also, we have a composite data source called Word, where we see that EU is the master and West uh, is the slave. And let's examine the benchmark. Uh, a bit again. I will start the same sysbenchrate-limited.pl. We are starting our tra 10 transactions a second. And now I'm going to go here and issue the switch to vast command. And this geographical switching is possible because of the tungsten connectivity. Nothing but like piece other a proxy which is uh, actually capable of talking the uh, the MySQL wire protocol. So we don't need VIPs. The, uh, this switchover notifies all the connectors to switch over to the to the other data center. And if we examine it uh, it in a similar way, uh, transactions per second is dropped to zero, and switchover is done. But we will see, still see the queue length increasing. And I quickly move away from this screen. And my question is, did the failover work? Click the raise hand icon if you think that the failover worked here. You saw that the queue is still, still generated in Sysbench. OK, three people thinking, four people, that the failover worked. Five, OK. Six, okay, seven, eight, okay. So they were not convinced uh, by the fact that the queue is growing, but we are actually doing transactions. See that we are doing three transactions. Then in the next second, we are doing zero. And if you take a look at the average response time of a transaction, it's almost a minute. This is a default sysbench transaction, which contains like uh, 20 reads of different types and uh, two or three or four writes. So it's a lot of round trips. And the limitation we are, hit we are hitting here is not in the cluster solution itself. The limitation we are hitting here is the size of the planet and the speed of light. Because we are trying to use a West Coast database from the EU with uh, with all the round trip times involved, and with this demonstration, I wanted to wanted to show to you that despite that uh, you are capable of building cross continent a cross continent cluster which will be transparent to your application, you probably don't want to do it, 
at least not cross-continent. If your data centers are uh, more close to each other, this is not uh, this is not that much of an issue. And if we check the benchmark again, we will see when the switchover happens because suddenly the latency will be okay again. Okay, and it started to do 50 transactions per second, and uh, the latency, the number, the latency started to decrease. And it started to decrease because the transactions we are currently processing were waiting in the queue for uh, 150 seconds. And now it, uh, it is catching up. And I give it back to Robert. Thank you, Peter. That was a great demo. So let me see if I can pull myself up in the list and switch over. Okay. Let me know when you can see my screen. Oh, I need to tell Microsoft to switch here. Are you able to see the demo architecture slide, Peter? I see it. Yes. This is Elisa. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Um, good. So we're almost done here. We have a number of questions coming up. I don't want to hold back on those. Let me just talk about a couple of two practical items uh, before we conclude. Um, so the first thing, I think Peter uh, really showed this uh, very well, so we don't have to harp on it too much, but the, the, the tungsten installation is done through a, a procedure called TPM, stands for Tungsten Package. Um, manager, and this is a really critical feature for setting up these large-scale systems. And the key here is that you develop that tungsten any file that Peter showed. It's very simple. Um, you then download the software and you just run TPM install. And it it's run on this. It works on the same principle as something like Chef or or Puppet, where you have a specification that. Uh, tells what that machine should be doing, and then TPM will, will read that any file and do correct configuration so that it takes up the role that's specified in that file, be it a connector, be it a, a master, a slave, or whatever. And that's how you, that's how you get these systems uh, set up very efficiently. Moreover, it allows you to do things like upgrades automatically. Um, you, know, you can just change, for example, you can change the any file, and then you can run a command called TPM update which will then make appropriate configuration changes on each host. So it's a very powerful feature that allows you to have this sim single file that describes the overall system that you want to build and then have the right things happen on each host. That level of automation is really critical to get these systems to set up. The other thing I'd like to talk about is, is perhaps a more interesting issue, and that is deciding when to go with a composite data service versus multi-master. So the composite data services have, as you've seen, a number of big benefits. They don't generate conflicts. I mean, this is just master-slave. You only uh, the reason that happens is because you only update in one place. As a result, you don't have to change your applications. Just about every application that runs with MySQL will also run with MySQL master-slave with master-slave replication. As Peter showed you, the failover is transparent. Um, so that you can, in the case of a of a hard failover, you you'll get broken connections. That's not really easy. To, that's not really possible to avoid. But um, your applications don't have to be reconfigured. They don't have to be restarted. As long as they know how to retry a transaction, they will be able to to um, handle any kind of reconfiguration. And then finally, it works very well with statement replication. And that's a big benefit because statement replication is quite efficient, particularly if you're doing large transactions um, that affect a lot of rows. Things to consider, well, the first thing is the high latency of writes to primary master. As Peter says, if you're, spread, if you're going between from, from Ireland to the West Coast, which is the demo you just saw, that's not good for applications to have to have, take that hop when they're talking uh, between, application, uh, between applications um, or between application and database. It follows from that that when you do a switch, which Tungsten reduces to a single line command, that's the easy part. You actually may need to switch the locus of your application activity over to that side as well. That's the part that, that we don't handle and it involves reconfiguring uh, DNS records, activating applications so that they begin you know, maybe firing up additional app capacity on your on your DR site. And there's a final issue, which is that that having this type of of um, 
of configuration does introduce some coupling, which can be a problem if you have flaky network connectivity between the sites. So as we looked at the, um, you know, as we looked at in the Amazon uh, case, you don't want to do things that introduce unnecessary coupling. So it's something to think about, um, it, you know, when you when you deploy this. That said, this is the most common way to spread data across sites by far. Um, the, the, we've dealt with many, many, many applications, and the reason is it requires no app changes. On the other hand, multi-master, this is really where we all want to be. I, I think that if, if we all had our druthers, it would be great to run completely independent applications, talking to completely independent databases, and have them magically reconcile each other. And the reasons are obvious. There's, there's no coupling between the sites. So that's a very, very powerful benefit for, for high availability. There's no failover. If things stop, and this is, in, in fact, in, in, in failures of entire sites, it's pretty rare to lose your data. But even with, with it, whether with Amazon or on-premises, it's very common to have it be un inaccessible for a day or more. That's just not an uncommon feature. So you just get the site fixed. When it comes back, everybody exchanges the transactions that were missed because they're stored in logs and you're back in, uh, you're back in business again. No changes required. And then, of course, the, the right latency is a huge benefit. The thing about multi-master is that there are some things you have to consider and you have to test carefully. And this is true for every single multi-master solution. There's obviously potential for conflicts. Um, Tungsten does not magically resolve conflicts. It gives you a lot of ways to avoid them or make them less likely. We can do this through filtering you definitely have to look for conflicts and decide how to manage them. As a result, it's quite common to um, require app changes. And it happens that also with multi-master, just to avoid data drift, we recommend using row replication. This just gives much better results because there's, there's no ambiguity um, about query subclauses and things like that that, that can cause data drift in multi-master situations. That said, it's actually surprising how many applications do work well with multi-master. I'll just give you three examples. Applications that primarily add data, you know, sort of test results scoring or something like that, they work very well multi-master. Another thing that tends to be very helpful is, is if your application is largely or entirely based on auto-increment keys and doesn't use, uh, for example, natural keys, which have the possibility of then duplicating across sites. And finally, um, uh, SaaS applications tend to support multi-master quite well in many cases, and the reason is that many SaaS applications have their customers primarily in one region. Therefore, you can assign a particular customer to a single region, have them do all their rights there, um, and have other customers in other regions. In this case, it's exactly the case that uh, it's exactly the situation that Peter just demonstrated, which is that. Um, there, there's just no conflicts because the applications are writing to different schemas. So with that, um, we'll leave you with uh, just some links on where to get information. Uh, the cluster and replication documentation is available on the Continuant website. Uh, software, uh, the replicator is out on Google, code.google.com. The clustering software is from downloads. And then, of course, check out the Percona and Continuant websites. There's a wealth of information, including blogs um, and all kinds of other um, uh, consulting and other things like that, that that can help you. So, with that, Elisa, I turn it back to you. I think we're ready to answer some questions. Great. Thank you, guys, very much. Just wanted to invite people to continue to uh, ask their questions in the GoToWebinar questions panel. We'll take as many as we can in the next few minutes. And like I said before, if we don't get to you, don't despair. We will get to you after the webinar through a blog post or through reaching out directly. All right. So, guys, you ready for your first question? Here it goes. What are the benefits of Tungsten in comparing with Galera Cluster? Can you compare the two? Peter, you want to go for that, and I'll uh, follow on. Okay. So the two things are completely different. So it's uh, it's like uh, apples to oranges comparison. The replication works uh, 
uh, absolutely absolutely differently. Uh, so under different circumstances, you will have uh, you will have different benefits. So let's say in uh, in tungsten, you have to avoid conflicts yourself or configure uh, conflict avoidance at the replicator level to make sure that uh, conflicting data is not replicated between sites, but uh, but it doesn't prevent you to to write data to a to a site which doesn't belong there. In uh, ExtraDB cluster, this is resolved uh, with the certification process. So if you have a multi-master conflict, you end up having the certification failure, which is a failed transaction, which is a rollback ultimately. But your application still has to handle that rollback. And also, uh, if you have a, a multi-master conflict, a rollback uh, is a really expensive operation. It involves copying back data from undo. So if you have a lot of conflicts anyways, which means that you will have trouble, uh, you won't have the same kind of trouble with extra DB cluster, but you will still have kind of trouble because you will have pretty bad performance in that case. It will work, but it will work uh, it will work re really slowly. But you know the the two products are like completely different, completely. So the the replication is the, the replication is like it, it's not the same, really not the same. Yeah, and I would just add to that that, and I wanted Peter to go first because he's he's sort of looking at this and has doesn't have sort of the natural vendor bias uh, on tungsten that I do. But I think that two things that really stand out for me are, first of all, because we're based on async master slave underneath, we can handle very lumpy workloads, and this is something that we deal with a lot of customers. People doing huge transactions that. Um, you know, maybe, for example, in Glare, would end up blocking the queue for a substantial length of time. Um, those are handled quite well uh, by Tungsten. Um, you know, we can also handle, you know, my ISAM, so all this dirty stuff that you tend to find in, in real applications, uh, master slave, and hence Tungsten handles very well. The second thing that Tungsten does is that it allows you to build systems that are fully decoupled between sites. In the case of Galera, you can't build truly independent systems using Galera impl uh, replication because Galera, every time you commit or try to commit in one location, it's going to want to go ahead and certify with all the members. So the um, Tungsten allows you to build these systems which um, are completely independent and where you can cut the links between them for even a couple days and then just as soon as the links are restored, they, they join back up and work again. So as Peter says, there's definitely it's definitely apples to oranges and there's 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 some fairly big um, differences in the benefits that these offer. Okay, great. Um, several people have asked multiple questions, and I'm going to try to get um, one question at least per person. In, in the it's the top of the hour. Robert, do you, and Peter, do you have a couple of extra minutes for me to ask a few more questions? Absolutely. Okay, and audience, if you yes. have to. Audience, if you have to leave, please know that I will send you a recording of this webinar um, so you won't miss a thing. And there will be a follow-up blog post so you can ask additional questions once that is up and running too. All right, so on to the next question. If we want to replicate from multiple masters to one server hardware, for example, Fanon, which approach, approach is the best, using tux, Tungsten Fanon or native MySQL replication with multiple instances, instances under different port on the same hardware. Oh, that's a so the Elisa, could you repeat that one? So the question is because that's a complex question. Yeah, um, and and you guys can pop up the questions too to take a look. Um, all right, so it is if we want to replicate from multiple masters to one server hardware with Fanon, which approach is best, using Tungsten with Fanon or native MySQL replication with multiple instances under different ports on the same server, or same hardware? Uh, okay, I got it. Yeah, thanks. Well, I think I, one thing I should point out is if you're running, um, you know, any of the production versions of MySQL, Fanon isn't supported. Um, so Fanon, uh, Peter, correct me if I'm wrong, that's going to come out. I know Maria... Um, MariaDB is going to support this. I don't know if 
don't believe 5.6 supports it. I think it's coming out in 5.7. So there's, there's one kind of obvious choice there that if you want it to work on the servers you have in production now, Tungsten's your only choice. Um, I think any of, the, any of the, I've seen a few things discussed before that involved, uh, you know, kind of kludgy switching between, um, you know, between master ports and they just don't work. Um, you, you definitely want to use something like Tungsten to do it. Okay, Peter, did you have anything to add on to that? No, so if you have the fed-in approach and MariaDB supports that, uh, then uh, you are able to join uh, between your different sources, which is which is something you have to do at the application level if you are using multiple instances. So, question is, do you want to have that, or what is easier for you? If you don't want to have it, what is easier for you, managing fed-in or managing multiple instances? So. Okay, um, next question. If multi-site plus multi-master is a requirement, in what circumstances in conti is continuing tungsten the better solution? In what circumstances is something like Bercona Extra DB Cluster a better solution? I'll, I'll go first on this one. So I think that, so one of the things that I think is a big benefit of of the extra DB cluster is it doesn't let your data get inconsistent and there's just applications that that need to be that cannot permit data to become inconsistent and want copies of data in multiple places at once in that case Galera or Bracona DB extra or extra DB cluster is your only solution on the other hand if you're um, if you're going over geographic distance and what you're looking for is being able to deal with lumpy workloads or have high performance or being able to do things that really involve complete decoupling of the of the servers, then I think tungsten is the better solution. That that would be sort of my take on it. And Peter, what do you have to say about that? Okay, so uh, my take on this is that uh, my first question which came to my mind is do you have an hour or more? But uh, but um, what it boils down to is, is your application good with asynchronous replication or, or better with synchronous replication? So the answer to that that it, it's really, really application dependent. What does it tolerate more? If writes are stopped or if writes are delayed, for example, for uh, you know when uh, when things start to fail. So the the answer is it depends on the application. But you know the correct answer for 99% of the complex database related questions is always it depends. So this is one of them. But Robert had a very good summary. Yeah, I I agree completely. It really does depend, and we'll do that we'll do that hour talk on some other occasion. <laughs> Thank you, guys. All right, I think I'll take um, two more questions, and then the, the rest of them will be answered, as I said before, afterwards. All right, so let's see here. Um, is it possible in a master-slave setup to automatically switch reads to the master when the slave is lagging? Uh, yes. That's a, in fact, that's a great connectivity feature. We, unfortunately, like like the difference between this and extra DB cluster, we couldn't show everything, but there's uh, there's a level of service where you can specify um, what's the maximum latency you'll tolerate on a slave. Let's say you set it to 60 seconds. We'll either find you a slave that's within that latency when you when you form your connection. If we can't find it, you go back to the master. Same thing applies if um, if no slaves are available um, because they've all failed or they're down for maintenance. You automatically go to the master. Okay, um, and then the last question um, for now is, will the tungsten connector work across hybrid database replication? Will it work to replicate between Oracle and MySQL? Ah, let me, yeah, that's an interesting question, and the, the answer is no, and um, I, if I could just put in a quick plug here for open source, we can't really, there's really two questions under there. Um, one is, I, I think, is can you use the connector to have um, 
to have transactions automatically sent to two places, perhaps different databases. Um, and in that case, the answer is no, but it's because that's just a very difficult system to get to work. We had a previous product that did that. It didn't work right. The other question, though, is whether the connector in general will work with, the, um, with Oracle. And the answer is no. And that's because Oracle has a proprietary wire protocol. The connector magic that you were seeing today depends on us being able to inspect the wire protocol and, um, and for example, correctly identify a transactional boundary so that we can hold connections, reform connections in other locations. Uh, that kind of magic is very difficult to do um, on Oracle. And in fact, what you'd find if we were sitting there in the middle, of uh, you would probably not be able to get Oracle support because it violates the EULA to, uh, to look at the protocol. So for now, your best bet is to use open source databases. OK. Um, Peter, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, to that, no. I have one thing to add now looking through the question. Sure. We had a question that, can you correct, Robert, that it is possible to write to a Galera cluster that is not entirely online? So uh, what Robert talked about, or what we talked about, is that if you have a node failure, writes are blocked until, uh, in case of a non-graceful node, node failure, until that node reaches the suspect time mode. So we didn't talk about that you, when you have a node failure, writes are stopped completely un until eternity, until you recover the node, but rather until it reaches uh, suspect time mode. I just uh, ended short of the cluster. I just wanted to clarify that one. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Okay, perfect. Okay, everybody, thank you so much. Um, Robert and Peter, great job. We have lots of good feedback here. Audience, thank you so very much for your time today. As I said, everyone will get an email on the next 48 hours with a link to the recording and to the slides. So be sure to take a look at that or share it with your um, coworkers or peers. Um, just want to remind everyone that Percona Live, the next Percona Live is in Santa Clara, April 1 through 4, and you'll be able to meet Robert and Peter um, as well as lots of people from Percona and continue it. So it's a good chance for you to powwow with them and ask them additional questions in person. I'll be there too, so you can say hi to me. Um, with that said, thank you everyone again. Have a wonderful evening, afternoon, or morning, depending on where you're calling in from, and we hope to see you again on future web webinars. Everyone have a wonderful time.